Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome all of you to our broadcast today of 3rd Avenue Missionary Baptist Church uh, for our midweek Bible teaching session. I'm going to look and just kind of give an overview or a brief overview of the book of Philemon and just kind of take a look at what's going on with the book of, uh, with the epistle of Philemon and see if we can get a lesson or a message from God as to maybe how we can start handling people or dealing with uh, people in a better way or in a positive manner. We want to learn how to deal with people that are not in our same situations or uh, possibly from a different culture, but we want to learn how to deal with them and handle them in a respectful manner and in a beneficial way that uh, they can uh, prosper and you know, find their way in life. And, and the book of Philemon will show that. And it's a very interesting uh, epistle that has been shared with us by Paul. This is one of his first epistles from his imprisonment, from his first imprisonment in Rome. Uh, so it is very interesting. But I just want to kind of look at it and look at the central message of it and then uh, see if we can pick some nuggets up here that will help us along our life's journey. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our lesson for today. Gracious and loving Master, we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would use me for your teaching and that you would be uplifted and edified from the teaching that is shared today. I pray, Father, that you would bless those who are watching and who are tuning in. I pray that you would give them strength and give them focus and desire to learn more of your word. I pray that you would illuminate your scriptures to us and open it up to us, Father, and Allow us to receive it and let us also utilize it. Thank you, God, again, for being our God and being our everything. Thank you for life, for health, for strength. Thank you for the passion that you've given us and the desire that you have instilled in us to continue to work towards becoming better and stronger Christians. Father, I pray for um, all those that are listening, those that will hear this message maybe some other time or in some other uh situation i pray father that they would get the message that is shared and that it would lead towards a peaceful life it lead towards a prosperous and beneficial life lord open our doors to uh, friendships and relationships and teach us a more excellent way of life father again thank you thank you thank you and it's in your son jesus name i pray this prayer amen amen book of philemon Book of Philemon that we see here is one of the uh, one of the epistles that uh, Paul wrote when he was uh, in one of uh, possibly his first imprisonment in Rome around A.D. 60, and Paul now is writing this uh, epistle, but it is a it is it is a unique epistle. This is the epistle is extremely personal. This is an actual letter that was written to Philemon. And that's usually it's these epistles and letters that Paul would write would be uh, more of kind of open subject. And it would be geared, geared towards uh, a group of brethren or a church or something of that matter. But this is a personal letter. This is written personally to Philemon and actually is dealing with a personal situation. It's not dealing with a corporate situation, but it but it shows how sometimes you, this is sometimes when uh, people have those one-on-one -on -one conversation. This this is not something that is directed. This this letter was not directed to the entire body, to the church, so to speak. But it was this is like a more of a friend to friend situation, or even a. Um, a business person to business person relationship or whatever the case is whatever the situation but it's more personal and now Paul is writing it and he's writing it to Philemon and look at how he opens it he opens this letter even though uh, it's not corporate he opens it up and he opens it but he opens it up in a way that he shows that I know quite a bit about you and he's showing great affection and by showing that I'm, I've been, you have been on my mind and you have been on my heart and you're truly a friend 
and you're also a brother beloved and you're I'm letting you know that I watch and keep up with you my desire is to follow you and I honor the work that you're doing and the labor that you're doing and I want you to know that not only myself but the family the body we're uh, close-knit and we we appreciate how you stayed with us and, and we've stayed on one accord. So now we'll see that when we look at how he opens the letter. He opens it, he says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Athia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. He's opened it up, he's showing that it's kind of, it's kind of open to he's letting them know that I know you on a grand level. I know you as a, as a, a family, so to speak. And I'm opening it up and letting you know that we're all thinking about you. We all uh, we all are on one accord and we work together. This for uh, Afia, the sister, he's showing her which is is uh, uh, bounty for her name means bounty or blessings or uh, addition or growth. But then also Acapus, which was a fellow soldier. Acapus was a soldier of war. He was a soldier who rode horses. He was one of the ones who would ride out and lead out on horsemen. And he, he was a horseman. And they all worked together. And then he says, our fellow soldier and to the church that meets in your home. He's establishing, Paul is establishing the relationship. He's, he's establishing I, we are personal with each other. We're not just uh, um, people that speak every now and then. We're not ones that just know of each other, but we really don't know each other. He's letting you know we, we run in the same circle and we're all together in this thing. And so now he's approaching him that way so to open up his mind, to let him know that it must be something serious for him to identify these things and this is how sometimes we do with friends that we have pro close relationships with. We open up by, uh, by just talking about some of the personal intimate details of the relationships that we have and how we know each other and it's, it, oh, he opens with that but then he comes with thanksgiving and prayer. It's a strong relationship when you have um, thanksgiving and prayer. That's more than friendship. That's brother beloved. That is that is that is a relationship now. And many times it would be great for us if we would learn how to pray not just for our brothers. To pray with our brothers. We're in a time now to where we need to really establish a stronghold in our relationship with people now because friendship is getting far and in between and especially brotherly love. It's becoming a little bit more difficult to establish those kinds of relationships with one another. And then we have, the, some have the mindset of you're showing cowardness and and you're 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 weak and or when you have the relationship to where you can sit down and commune with your brother and express some of your feelings and some of your desires when you're hurt, showing your emotion, you know it seems as though that's kind of weak, but really it's strength because when you have someone that you can talk to when you're hurting and let them know how you're hurting. When you have some friends that you can talk to when you don't know what decision to make and you need somebody with wise counsel that you can trust and honor, that's showing strength because that's wisdom. I'd rather, be, I'd rather have somebody I can turn to that I can trust and I can depend on to give me wise counsel or, or to that one that will say, let's pray together, let's talk to our God together. We do everything else together, but we don't lift each other up together. And now we're at a time where we need to stop praying for one another and, and start praying with one another. 
So now he's getting ready to start with the thanksgiving. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanksgiving and prayer. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. We have to learn to lift one another up. <clears throat> it's too easy to tear each other down. It takes effort, it takes a desire, it takes strength to learn to lift one another up. And we need to exercise these gifts that God gives us. We have the way and we have the ability to lift one another up. So we need to learn to take advantage of it. And now Paul is saying, I've been praying for you and I'm praying with you. Then when we come together, we're going to pray together because we're brothers, and I know that there's strength in prayer. The collective body of Christ coming together will avail much if we learn how to be in unison, if we learn how to come together. We need a, sometimes we need, we just need a friend to be a sounding board. Sometimes we need them, but then we also need to encourage them so that when they are weak, then they can gain strength and encouragement to move forward and get better and prosper. We now need to learn how to lift one another up. We need to learn how to carry one another's burdens and their loads for them when it's too much for them to bear. We need to learn how to be a shoulder to cry on or to lean on. We need to learn how to be a sounding board for good advice, for getting advice. We need to learn how to teach one another and commune together with the scriptures. We need to dissect the scriptures together. We need to come together, dwell together in unity, in love, and in the faith. Paul now is establishing that Philemon and Paul have this even when they are apart. He says, I'm still in awe of what you are doing because I see that you don't get uh, uh, holy when I come around, but you stay that way when I'm not in your presence. And I admire that, and it is motivation to us. That's why he says it's refreshing to the saints. It's refreshing to the saints. So when I can be across town and I can hear about you, Philemon, about how you're handling business and how you're staying on the battlefield and how you're you're encouraging others. He's, he's saying to he's saying, Philemon, we're watching you. We're watching you. I hope that you're watching us. And as we often say, we're praying your strength in the Lord. And I hope that you're doing the same with us. This is how we succeed in our Christian walk. Praying for one another. Praying with one another. This is how we prosper in our way that we go. When we're across town and our friends are few and in between, we still hold to the faith because we know God is going to bring us back together. And then when we hear about each other across town or across country, we can always depend on the fact that as long as they hold on to the faith, I know it's going to be a good word what I hear from them. I know it's going to be something good. I know it's something beneficial taking place. And ask yourself the question. I always ask you to ask yourself questions that to evaluate your own life. When people hear about you, what is, what is the word being said? What are, what are they saying about you when people are talking about you? If they're speaking the truth, is it good? So I, I say it this way, something that, it, it doesn't hurt me when people speak bad about me and it's a lie. It hurts me when they speak bad about me and it's the truth. So what is your conversation like when your name comes up? Is it, is it one that says, I know who he believes in, and I know how he carries himself, 
and I would love to see him or love to talk with him or be around him. This is what Philemon's life was like in the eye, from the eyes of Paul and from Paul's standpoint. And Paul was encouraging him. And, listen, and look at Paul's position right now. This is an epistle that he wrote from, when, from his first imprisonment in Rome. He's in a tough situation right now. And he's talking about how he's happy and how he's excited about the word that he has heard about his friend and his brother. Can you do that? Can you, can you be that person to where you're in a tough situation, don't really understand how things are going to play out, don't know if I'm going to get out or how long they're going to hold me or how long I'm going to be in this situation, but yet and still my heart is still rejoicing at the blessings of someone else, at the word that I heard about somebody else. Can you do that as a believer? Maybe you're a pastor. Can you rejoice in the prosperity of another pastor when it seems like you're in a tough spot in your position of pastoring right now? Can you still rejoice? Can you still have a genuine, genuinely good feeling and a good uh, 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 understanding for someone else when it's their season and maybe it's not your season? So the Paul is showing you that it's possible. And then I, what I, another thing that I like about this is Paul Philemon by no means is a perfect man. And he's subject to mistake and error. And so is Paul. But yet and still, they don't get off into that. The conversation never really leads to that way to where they start to, to dwell on the negatives. And that's something else we need to learn. Can you learn to have conversations with your friends without dwelling on the negatives? Don't you think the world does enough of that already? Don't, don't you think a person is torn down enough to where that you don't need to add to that when y'all come together you know it's going to be something negative or something woe is me I'm so glad that Paul didn't come in with this letter and I'm in prison now and I don't know when I'm going to get out and, and I don't have any bond money to get me out or, or they falsely accuse me and, and I hadn't done anything wrong Paul never addresses that Paul doesn't even let that enter into his mind have you drawn close enough to God to where you say, no matter what the situation is, I'm still going to be joyful. I'm still going to grab for the joy that God offers to all of his children. He's doing it now, and he's showing that I've been praying for you. I want to pray with you some more in person. I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that one day we'll get together again. But until then, I just want you to know that you're on my heart. And that's what a good friend will always do. All, he'll keep you on his heart and they will keep you on their mind. They'll keep you lifted up in prayer because they realize that the only saving grace we have comes from the grace giver. And I'm, I'm longing for the spiritual growth of Christian believers in their daily walk to where they realize that as long as you keep your mind and you keep your subject matter focused on Christ, when you keep it in perspective, keep life in perspective, when you learn how to walk in a spiritual way, then you will understand that I don't want to ever get out of it. I don't want to ever let it go. That's when life becomes worth living, truthfully. Whenever you learn that I've got Jesus and I'm not going to turn loose, I'm going to learn from his word how to carry myself, how to deal with life, whatever life throws at me, I'm going to learn how to deal with it from the way that my Father in heaven has taught me how to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it by any other instructions. I don't want to take any other counsel. I don't want to take any other guidance. I want to handle it like a child of God. And I guarantee that life will become 
more profitable than you could ever imagine. You can have some things that this world just cannot give you. So now Paul is at that point now to where he's maturing in the faith and he's sharing it because he's with like-minded believers. He's got soldiers with him in his corner. He's got workers with him in his corner. Now he's dealing with Philemon and he's given this prayer. And now in his prayer, he gets ready now to move on to a request. He's, he's, he's fixing to give out, make some requests to his brother. He's going to do it in such a unique way that we need to pay attention to it because now it, 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 it gets to a point to where now they know one another, they know both are serving God, and now we're going to test it by learning how to deal with each other in a Christ-like manner, but living in a Hebrew society. They're in a Hebrew society, they're working under Hebrew law, but they're going to deal with each other like God-fearing Christians, just like he said, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul was not the only prisoner of Christ Jesus here. So was Philemon. So was Achippus. And so was uh, Appia. Appia. They both were, they all were prisoners of Christ Jesus. They were Christian. They were believers in Jesus Christ. And they were, they were to walk in that way much more than they were to walk like Hebrews. Now look what he says here. He says, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do, oh, <coughs> excuse me, order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. That's a big change right there. Something really change right there. Paul is saying, I hold some authority as a believer. Not only am I just a, a believer in Christ Jesus, but I'm a chief apostle. I have some rank here that God has ordained over my life. And I can make some requests just based on the rank that I have. But I don't want to do it that way. I want to appeal to you in love. Who does that remind you of? That reminds me, when I look at it real closely, that reminds me of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, as it relates to your salvation, don't you know that he can demand you do right? He can make you do right? But he said, I don't appeal to you that way. I want to appeal to you in love. I don't want to make you do what you're supposed to do. And Jesus does not make us do what he wants us to do. He gives an appeal. Paul here is doing the same thing with Onesimus. He's saying, I got authority. I can, I can work my weight if I want to. And I can put some mandates down. And I can stand behind it and make you do what I'm fixing to ask you to do. But I'd much rather do it, I would much rather you do it out of love. Right now, Paul, pay close attention. He's dealing with Philemon, and really what he's doing is he's molding Philemon for the future. By putting him in a situation or and giving him opportunity to learn that there is a more excellent way of life. He's molding him now. He's putting one of those scenarios in front of him now. It's a time to make a choice and make a decision. And he's putting it there. And he's teaching him that love is the way. I told you that Christ could have Christ has enough power that he can make man do anything he wanted to do. He can speak and man can appear. He can speak and man can be gone. He is in full control. But yet he says, I just want you to obey me out of love. I want you to love me the way I love you. I'm going to offer myself to you in love so that you can return the love back to me. This is what Onesimus, I mean Philemon, I mean, excuse me, this is where Paul is teaching 
Philemon right now, and he's going to put him in a situation now and give him an opportunity and show him the right decision to make and then allow him to make the choice of how to do it. That's what a good teacher does. A good, good teacher will put you in situations where you have to make a choice, but a good teacher will also give you the right choice to make and then says, now do what it is that you believe you should do. But I'm admonishing you to make the right choice. You're not doing me any good to put me in a situation to where I have to question it, but don't give me a right answer to choose from. Watch what it says. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. He said, look here, I'm appealing to you for my son Onesimus. Well, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag right now a little early. Onesimus was a slave of Philemon. I'm going to touch on this slavery because, you know, that's a very sensitive subject when we talk about slavery in the Bible. Because we always talk about how we want to promote slavery. God promoted slavery. And some would say that this is the reason why I can't go with the Bible. Because it promotes slavery. Right now we see Philemon had slaves. He, he owned Onesimus. I'm admitting that and sharing that with you. But that does not mean that God promoted slavery. That means that slavery was going on in this time period. It, this Bible never said that God said, go out and make some slaves or get you some slaves. But we are humans. We make choices on our own. And God did not tell us to go get slaves. These were slaves under Hebrew law and Hebrew order. So if you want to blame somebody, you might want to look at the Hebrews. Because watch what happens here. We see that Onesimus is a slave, and Onesimus right, Onesimus right now is with Paul. He's with Paul, but he was a prisoner of Philemon. Now Paul is making appeal for Onesimus, who became my son. Look what he says. He became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you. But now he has become useful both to me and you. All right. Now, he was a slave that ran away from Philemon. When he ran away from Philemon, he <clears throat> ended up in the company of Paul. When he got to Paul, he was a stranger. But after hanging with Paul, he became his son. How did that happen? It happened because under Hebrew law, when a slave left, when a slave left uh, uh, his master or ran off from his master, then he would take the, ch uh, uh, you could read it over in the book of Deuteronomy. He would run off from his master. The rule was, and I'll read it for you in verse number 23, I mean Deuteronomy 23 verse 15. If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand him over to his master. Let him live among you, wherefore he likes in whatever town he chooses. Do not oppress him. That was under the Hebrew law. If a slave ran off and he ran into you and your company, you do not oppress him. You do not send him back to the master. But you give him lodge and you feed him. So look what uh, Paul does. Paul obeys Hebrew law. By obeying Hebrew law, he keeps it. I want to ask you a question now. Has somebody entered you that entered into your presence that's been caught up in this world? When it's been caught up with the rituals of this world, which could be a form of slavery? kept them in bondage, they can't uh, survive under the conditions of life and what this world has to offer and they're running and searching for a way out and made it to your presence and when they got there, could you give them food? 
could you take a soul that you don't know and uh, as a stranger and turn him into a son, turn him into a family member, one that you can love? It was the Hebrew. It was the Hebrew law that said you can't uh, that they were slaves, meaning that that was a part of the ritualisms of the world. That's the world order set up that had slavery, but then they also had laws that said that when they if they run off from their master, don't oppress them, don't send them back. And then I'm gonna say the same thing about God. When somebody's been caught up in bondage, when they come to you. Will you oppress them? Or will you nurture them? Will you give them food? Will you give them shelter? Not only did Paul give Onesimus shelter and food, he gave a physical, he gave him spiritual nourishment. Gave, that's how he became his son. He blessed him spiritually by teaching him the word of God. Can you say that that's your plot in life? Or that has happened for you or maybe happened to you because now he look what he's done now for this slave he said at first he wasn't profitable to you he's, he's saying Philemon he wasn't profitable to you because he was running off and if he wasn't trying to run off if he was still there he always had it on his mind to leave so he probably wasn't very profitable to you and that, that's one thing about slavery one thing about slavery is that it's never profitable to society. <coughs> Excuse me. It has never been profitable to society. It has always been a hindrance. When we look at what was gained and lost with uh, slavery, we see that no one really won from it. When we look at what it cost society because of slavery, we don't. We have lost so many possible relationships that could have been built between men. We've lost. We we have caused so much dissension. Even though in this country it's been uh, abolished so long, the ramifications of it still reign. The the just the mere speech of it or conversation of it still brings up strife in the lives of so many people because it caused so much separation, so much dissension. It has caused people to never be able to establish possible positive relationships or working conditions with one another because of what slavery did just in this country alone. So I'm sure that it has done it in many other countries because we're not the only ones who have seen this or faced this or even been a part of it. But it was never profitable. But when it's dealt with the way that God's children deals with it, you can get past it. Here's what Paul says now. He says he wasn't profitable. Onesimus was not profitable to you. And now he's with me. But watch what he says. He says, while I was in chains, he says, uh, he became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to me, you and to me. Look what happened here. You've got a man that's come out of chains and needing help, coming to a man that once walked free, who is now in chain and getting help from the one who was chained up. You see what God can do? God can take the least and turn him into the greatest. And he can take the greatest and teach a story through him by allowing him to become the least. Paul was a man that provided refuge and shelter for this man. Now this man is being profitable to the one who had so much to give him in the first. And now God is orchestrating and putting it together. He said, Paul is saying, you see, he got to me with nothing and I gave him of the substance that I had and now the tables have turned I'm in prison now but that man now has become my son and he's profitable to not just me but for me and for you God is showing us that it's not about your substance 
that makes uh, of your physical substance that builds relationship and make you beneficial to others. It's about your relationship with God and your wisdom and your faith that determines the, the, uh, uh, how we can depend on God and lean on one another. The benefits were because we were Christ-centered. That's why he started off, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I can't get away from him. He, he's got me now. I'm locked in now. And no matter when I'm up or I'm down, he keeps putting blessings in, around me. What looked like was going to be a burden, because it looked like it was going to be a burden to Paul to have to warehouse Onesimus and have to feed him and take care of him because he couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't do anything. He was a slave. So it looked like he was going to be a burden. But he turns around and becomes a blessing. Isn't that something when you can do what the Lord asks you to do and he can take some, a bad situation and turn it out for your good? And now you got a prisoner that once ran from you and was no good for as long as you kept a taskmaster over his head. You couldn't get nothing but a fight and an argument out of it. But as soon as he gets into the company of God's children, now he's beneficial to you. You couldn't make him do what you wanted him to do. But now he's willing to freely do for you and bless you. But now, in order for the blessing to take place, there's got to be a change in your understanding about your brother. Let's keep on reading and see what God has for us. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to uh, uh, both to you and me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have you like to uh, I would have like to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in change for the gospel but I did not want to do anything without your consent look what he said first he said I can make you do it because of the power that I have but now I make it a plea to you and I I'm also putting some authority back in your hands. I'm putting it, I'm putting it back on your plate to make a decision. He says I'm not. I'm, I wanted to keep him, but I can't do that I, because rightfully he's supposed to be with you. But I'm not going to keep him uh, uh, unless I get your consent. Now he said, I want to see how you handle this thing. Will you harbor hatred because he ran off from you? Will you? harbor an uh, unforgiving heart because he left you and didn't want to stay with you and you couldn't keep him and, and, and he got away from you? Will you let that hinder you? Even now that you see that the man Paul whom I, oh, Philemon respects and honor is saying, I love him. He is a son now. He who is my very heart. This man's got my heart. Are you going to let what was done in the past keep you from establishing a relationship, a prosperous relationship in the present? It's a tough one because many people struggle with trying to build those types of relationships and now the opportunity is here. Will you let pride get you to say, no, the slave. He's a slave. I bought him. He owes me. And he can't do anything unless I say he can do it. That's, that's, that's worldly talk. That's what the world is. I'm going to keep him down. I ain't going to never let him get up. Because now look at Onesimus. Look what he says about Onesimus. He said, I want to keep him so he can take your place. That's really a tough one now. Have you matured to the point to where you're willing to? To let somebody take your place as it, in relation to, to walking with your spiritual advisor or walking with your brother beloved. He said, he, Paul said it strongly, I want to keep him so he can take your place while I'm down here in bondage and in chains. Are you, are you willing? Are you, some of us, some of us are not strong enough to even let him take your place if you're an usher in the church house. Now he's saying this slave who I bought, who
who I own, who belongs to me. Now you said he's your son and he got your heart. You're going to let him take, and talk about letting him take my place. I'm Philemon. I'm one of God's children too. And you just met him. You met him, and, and this is what this is how you met him. Paul said you met him because, I mean, Philemon is saying, you may have met him because he ran away and ended up there. Paul is going to teach us that, no, I met him by divine intervention. He didn't run off from you and end up in my presence. God sent him. God sent Onesimus to Paul by divine intervention. He got the right one at the right place at the right time because this whole scenario with Onesimus, a slave, is teaching those that had power and had authority and had the favor of God how not to get beside themselves and think more highly of themselves than they ought. He said, I'm going to take the slave and bring you back down. But if you learn how to humble yourself and follow the direction of God, I'll exalt you right back up. All God is doing now is strengthening Philemon and Paul and Onesimus. God is in the business of lifting up, not tearing down. He's taken a slave master, a slave owner, and an imprisoned servant and elevating them spiritually to where they can walk as kings in this world and walk as respectable leaders in this world. And that's why he says to him, I wanted to keep him and, and let him take your place, but I will not do it without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. I don't want to force you into it. Paul is sharing with him now. He's teaching. He's teaching Philemon now. I'm not forcing you. I don't want to force you into making it, but I do want you to know what the right decision is. This is what good teaching is about. This is what good life lessons are all about when you come in contact with believers. Believers are not to force a person <clears throat> into making the decisions that they want them to make, but they are to put the right decisions in front of them so they all know what the right decision is, but not force you. So now he's, uh, he goes on and shares with them. Let me, let me bag up and read it again. So that, my, uh, that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good no longer as a slave. Mm. It's getting tougher and tougher for Philemon, but if, I believe Philemon is accepting the challenge. He's saying to him now, you're going to get him back now, but once you get him back now, I don't want him to go back to you as a slave. But better than a slave, he, he's, he wants him to go back, but better than a slave, as a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Look what he says. He left you a slave, indebted to you. But when he comes back, I don't want him to be looked at as a slave. I want him to be looked at as a brother in the Lord, a dear as, and as a man. Not as a commodity, not as an animal, not as, you know, uh, some free labor. I want him to be looked at as a man. I want him to be respected as a man. And I want him to be accepted as a brother. Hmm. Can we do that? Have we been able to accomplish that in society today? Have we been able to take those who have been in bondage? Have we been able to take those that we had rule over unjustly? Have we been able to been able to deal with those that didn't want to be with us anymore, that ran off from us? Have we been able to take them back and respect them as men and respect them as brothers? 
The only way you'll ever be able to do that is through Christ Jesus. Man has too much pride in him to make this declaration, to make this stand. you got to know God because it's going to take some love. It's going to take some humility. It's going to have to, uh, you're going to have to defeat pride to accept one another as brothers after what has been done. See, because we're looking now at is Philemon able to do it? But I'm going to tell you the, another question you ought to ask. Is Onesimus going to be able to do it? Philemon, we know it's a struggle for him to accept him as a brother and one that Paul could use to take his place. But Onesimus didn't run off from Philemon because he was happy. There were some deplorable conditions that he was under. Does he want to go back and deal with? Does he want to go back and deal with Philemon? That's another question you got to ask. So this love, it has to run from heart to heart and breast to breast. This humility has to not just come from Philemon, but Onesimus is going to have to humble himself too. He's going to have to fall under some humility of God. Because it's possible that he can harbor, easily harbor some hatred and some disgust with Philemon. And that's why they say the both need to come together. You might be on one side of the coin and another person on the other side. You might be looking down on somebody while this other person's got to look up on you. And just because you're looking down at disgust, don't think that that person is looking up with reverence. He's looking up with ill will. He's got a little bit of anger. He, he has just as much ought against you as you have with him. But the situation is, can y'all come together? And look what that Paul has done. Paul has put something, he paints it and puts it clear in front of him. He says, Onesimus is my brother now. I mean, uh, he's my son now. And he has my heart and I love him. But go back to verses 1 and 2 in and, and, and the introduction. What does he say about Philemon? He shares with Philemon, I love you. I go to church with you. My brothers and sisters, we are in awe of you. Pa 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 uh, Paul is doing something very unique. Paul is saying, I love you too, Philemon. I have a great affection for you. I admire the work you're doing. I pray for you just like I would pray for myself. I have confidence in you. I, I, I copy some of the things that you do because you are doing a marvelous work in the body of Christ. And they turn right back around and say, but you're slave. I love him too. Mm. Does that look like somebody we, rep, uh, we are here to represent? Doesn't that look like Christ? I love you. I love all of the world. I love all of my creation. But I want to see if you can do like this and learn how to love one another. Quit mistreating each other. Quit being mistreated by one another. And learn to love one another. He says, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him in as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Look what Paul is saying. Charge it to me. What he owe you or what he's done, charge it to me. I'll pay it. We can always see the image of Christ whenever man walks in the way of Christ. Whenever you walk in the way of Christ, Christ will always be shown. Paul is doing a marvelous job. Now, Paul is in prison. He's in chains. But his words, his voice, his authority goes beyond the chains. So you can hold the body down, but you can't hold the spirit. Paul is showing you this by example. Chain my hands, chain my feet. Bound me, close the door, put a lock on the door. 
But if you mess around and let my word get out, it's still going to change. Believers, let them change. They're going to chain you down. They're going to stop you from opportunities of life. But if they keep letting me speak the name of Jesus, they keep letting me call on his name with prayer, they keep letting the Holy Spirit teach me wisdom and how to obey him. Ain't no chain strong enough. When you sing that song, break every chain, because it'll break every chain. Paul has said, I'm going to put some word on him. I'm going to put some affection from God in his life. I'm going to set it in front of him, and I'm going to give him the give both of them the opportunity to work out a miracle in the front of everybody, because you can best believe that the people knew that Onesimus was a slave. They knew that he belonged to uh, he belonged to Philemon. But now they get an opportunity to see him come back. See, he ran off a slave and came back a brother. He, he ran off from bondage, but he came back free. Now all the slaves are looking, should, should I run off? And I say to you, you can run off. You just need to know who to run to. You need to run to the arms of Jesus. You need to run to the ark of safety. And Paul says, whatever it is that he owes you, I'll pay it. Writing this is with my own hand, I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. <laughs> it's a good teacher that it always puts something back on your plate that really makes you think. And this is what Paul is saying now. Whatever it is he owes you, charge it to me. Because I love him. But don't forget you owe me. Don't forget I've done some stuff for me that, that, that you never, you, you, you didn't pay for now. So don't get beside yourself. If you want a little something out of the deal, go on and say that. But, but don't get out of hand. Don't forget that you owe me. I keep telling you, it's going to always look like Christ when we walk in his ways. Look what Christ says for us. Christ says that I want you to do something for me, and, but don't forget that you owe me. And the reason Christ can say that is because you truly owe him. I owe him all. That's the song my father used to say. I owe him patience. I owe him witnessing. I owe him everything. I owe him me. Yes, I owe him. But it's a debt that you can't ever repay. Paul said the same thing to Philemon. You know you owe me, don't you? Because if it had not been for me, if it had not been for me, Onesimus, you wouldn't be who you are now. You wouldn't be where you are now. I thank God for him, but remember now, your experience and your introduction to Christ came through me. So you, to a degree, you owe me too now. Don't get out of hand. And then there are probably some other deals that they've done because they work together. You owe me. Don't forget that. Remember, <clears throat> not that I'm holding it over your head saying that you have to pay me. I want you to remember it so that you can have mercy on Onesimus. If, you, if I didn't pressure you to pay me, you ought not to pressure Onesimus to pay you. He's not pressuring him to say, you give me my money. He's pressuring him. He's teaching him, look, we all have a debt that we cannot pay. God never asked us to repay a debt that we cannot pay. Just remember that you owe me. Just remember what I did for you so that you can learn how to be forgiving to somebody else. So you can learn how to be compassionate to somebody else. This book of Philemon is getting to be very interesting. He says to us now that, not to mention that you owe me, your, uh, owe me your very self. I do wish, my brother, that I, I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more, excuse me, than I ask. Not only do I want you to take him back, 
I want you to restore him. I want you to put him on his feet. I want you to receive him in as a brother. I want you to do more than I ask. And if I need anything in bondage, if you can afford it and send it, I want you to send me something. Not ask you for something that you don't have. Just ask you to give freely what you do have. And the one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul is saying that I won't be down always. My hope is to be with you because you pray that I come back. And I believe that God is a prayer answering God. I'm getting ready to close now and just sharing with you what he's what he's saying to him. Onesimus, I put I put a scenario in front of you. And it's for the benefit of all of us. It's for the benefit of all of us. We can learn how to respect mankind. We can learn how to lead mankind out of the turbulences of life, the bondages, the, the pitfalls of life. Even if we have a hand in being the cause of it. But we don't have to stay that way. We can learn how by scripture to restore our brothers. Restore relationships. And build them on the foundation of God. The foundation of God that teaches us. We can get rid of that ill will and hatred towards one another. When the bond and the free can learn how to dwell together in unity and not stand apart in hatred and division. Only way, you have to build it on the solid rock of love, which is in Christ Jesus. Closing with verse 23, it says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoners, in Christ Jesus sends you greetings, and so does Mark, Articus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let them know, let them know now. You're still a part of the body. And the body moves from the heart. And the heart is of God. And he's just showing it to him now. And he's putting it again. He's putting it on his plate for the last time. He says, you say you're a part of the body? We believe you are a part of the body. Here is a time that you prove yourself how you love the body by doing what God would ask the body to do. The body is asked to be led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God says, learn how to restore such a one in spirit of meekness and in love and in unity. God bless you. I hope you learned this great lesson from the book of Philemon. Till we meet again.